Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Blair. I'm a PhD student at the University of Washington, and in my research and my personal work, I like to make things. And I'm also interested in how and why people are making things. And this often leads to using machines in new contexts or as a part of different working practices that might have unique or niche requirements. And so for this talk, I wanted to think about how we can repurpose, adapt, and extend machines for use in these new contexts, or maybe put it in another way, how we can hack our interactions with machines to think about how we can build new ones. And so um, a little bit of context. I work with maker tools like 3D printers where I'm interested in printing geometry or with materials that might be difficult to do with uh, standard CAD CAM tools. I also work on some tools for open source laboratory automation where the goal isn't necessarily additive or subtractive fabrication, it's some secret third thing like executing an experimental protocol where you need to move little aquatic plants around. And uh, I also take kind of interest and inspiration from open source art communities where artists are writing code to generate visuals that they share with one another. And what kind of ties together all these contexts for me is in how we see people taking up automation in domain specific ways. So you know like what happens when you throw a 3D printer in a ceramic studio versus in a plant biology laboratory or bring a liquid handling robot into a maker space. And even though the, the hardware and the machines are basically the same here, the goals people have and the things people want to do can vary wildly. And I think this leads to people adapting technology and adapting to technology in ways that are really compelling to me. And so for some even broader context, I do this work as part of a lab called Machine Agency. Um, I just wanted to shout out some other recent projects from the lab here. They range from like design tools for knitting to uh, CNC milling using computational notebooks to philosophical explorations about making. So if you're interested in the, the people or projects shown here, you can check out our lab page at the top. And if anyone here is kind of curious about grad school, that's something I can talk to you about over the next day and a half. Um, so I think 3D printing is fun, and not only because it's fun to print things, but because as machines have gotten better, uh, it's just a machine that's used by a lot of different people. And so people might be familiar with the Benchy model. It's the 3D model of a, a tugboat that's designed to stress test your printer. And so a perfect Benchy is in the top left there. You know, it has these overhangs with unsupported filament, it has this big smooth hull to see if there's any surface deviations in your print, and these sorts of things. And then all the other images are posts to the subreddit Curse Benchies, where people post, <laughs> Benchies gone wrong. Um, and my favorite posts are always the, the accidental errors. So like this purple Benchy in the bottom left was sliced using a two millimeter layer height instead of a 0.2 millimeter layer height. Um, or the, the checkered one in the center had a white tower to switch between colors of filament and it kind of you know, collapsed into the back of the boat. And so if you look at the comments on these posts or in other kind of printer debugging communities, especially new makers may be expected to do something like this, where they got their model online or made one, um, they threw that into a slicer, maybe taking advantage of you know, a pre-configured slicing profile, get some G code out from that, put that on an SD card, and then out comes a pristine Benchy. But you know, as I'm sure people in this room have first-hand experience with, it, there might be an undefined amount of iteration between any two steps of this process. You might have to go tweak some geometry in CAD, you might have to tune some settings in your slicer, or maybe you have to actually physically calibrate or repair something on your machine to get the Benchy out that you kind of thought you were going to get. And so this process of going from curse to perfect Benchy requires skill and practice and just an overall understanding of what your machine is doing. And I think it's interesting how people gain those skills, but like the tools and resources to do that are generally out there and available. Uh, but what I guess I want to convince people of is that we should also be able to go the other way. And so I think this curse benchy looks kind of cool. Maybe people think it's disgusting, but kind of aesthetics aside, if I dial in my printer settings, I could probably churn out pretty good benchies reliably as long as I tend to my machine a little bit. But it's not clear to me at all how I could replicate this design on the right or how I'd even use kind of CAD and a slicer to try and recreate these weird surface deviations and uh, other, other just weird behavior we see going on. And so that's obviously tongue in cheek, but I think it's a more generally relevant point. So this is a, from a prior project in the lab and all the objects here are examples from professionals who use digital fabrication in their work to manufacture products in low volume. And so, in the objects you see on the screen, there's 3D printing and clay 3D printing and CNC milling and textile work and more. And the kind of takeaway for the purposes of this talk are that 
these objects aren't purely designed in CAD, but also kind of designed directly in the machine tool paths. And so, you know, what do I mean like, by that? Like the vase in the far left over there, the design is really driven by the mark that the end mill has left in the wood. And that's not something that's kind of encoded or specified in the geometry file. You just have to t try a bunch of settings and see what happens and see what looks good to your eye. And so when I think about this process, I'm reminded of, reminded of sketching, especially sketching as it comes up as a metaphor for using technology in all these different domains. So, you know, we can write, write an Arduino sketch and we can quickly prototype with some electronics. And this language in Arduino, la Arduino land about sketching is kind of inherited from the processing creative coding environment and the related P5.js framework where artists write code to generate visuals. And so if we can write a little program and, and we can sketch with pixels, we can sketch with LED, you know, what might it look like to sketch with a 3D printer or other machines like this? And so to think about this, I made P5.fab, which is a JavaScript library for controlling machines. And so here we're watching the, the machine kind of over extrude these one shot blobs and then bridge between them to make this more delicate vase structure. And uh, this is an example of what I kind of mean by designing directly in, in toolpaths, not in uh, CAD. So we have to specify how much filament is coming out on those blobs and we're kind of moving vertically out of the XY plane while we're doing that. And then to, to bridge between them, we have to kind of choose a speed so that the filament doesn't break, but it also doesn't sag. And so it's not shown here, but I'm just plugged in to, um, from my laptop to the, to the printer here over a wired USB connection, and I'm just sending instructions over serial. And those instructions are generated using JavaScript code. So just very basic overview of what it looks like. There's this fab object. It's associated with useful things like how big is the machine. And you can do things like move retract to a point. So move while pulling some filament away from the nozzle so we don't leak it everywhere. And so maybe we can access the max X and max Y properties of the machine to get to the center of the bed. Then we could extrude some filament and maybe we want to specify some details about how this is happening, like how fast we should move or how much filament to extrude. And we can use these really simple commands to quickly kind of build up more complicated objects. And so, you know, you can print some f fun things that you'd maybe be hard pressed to do with CAD and a slicer here. And you can do it in a really computationally modest way. Um, and so, you know, Cura or Prusa Slicer, whatever slicer you like, might come out with a wire printing mode or some other experimental slicing mode. But some of the motivation here is that I don't want to wait for my slicer to come out with a blob mode in order to print blobby things. And probably my slicer is never going to make blobs the way I like my blobs or make whatever mode it is that you want to be able to print. And so you can do other things too, like here's a, a, I thought it would be funny to print a handle on the side of a disposable cup. And so just calibrating two points on the side and then kind of print away. And, you know, again, the point here is not that printing a handle on the side of a disposable cup is the next killer app of 3D printing. It's just that, you know, what, what kind of opportunities come up when you don't care about some fundamental assumptions of 3D printing, like I have to print on the bed or I have to, uh, you know, print in the XY plane. So obviously I have some fun with this, um, but we wanted to see what other people thought. So we brought in some artists who kind of use code professionally in their work to produce art pieces, uh, but had minimal 3D printing experience. And then we brought in some experienced makers who had minimal programming experience. And there were maybe a bunch of ways that people used this in, in unexpected ways. But one thing that really stuck out to me was in iteration speed. So the makers kind of thought, oh, this is kind of quick. It's short circuiting my normal CAD CAM CNC workflow. I don't have to go back to CAD to make a small geometry change. But on the other hand, the makers were used to, or I mean, sorry, the artists were used to a purely digital workflow. And, you know, you have to wait for the, the nozzle to heat up, you have to wait for the object to print. And this all was kind of a, a longer feedback loop than they were used to. And so, you know, a little historical interlude in the center uh, of this talk. Um, as we think, rethink our abstractions to kind of sketching with machines, I'm reminded of the history of using machines to sketch things. And so this is uh, from 1971. It's a picture of Manfred Moore, who's an artist on the right, and um, uh, Esther Rose Wolfson, a computer scientist on the left. And they're hunched over this fancy new plotter at the Center for Meteorological Research in France. And, um, you know, it was like totally unprecedented at the time for artists to be able to use this machine creatively. The machine was super expensive, and the time with it was super precious. And, you know, obviously a lot has changed between the 1970s and now, but like kind of a lot hasn't. 
So for Moore and Wolfson, a computer was writing their drawing data to some magnet, magnetic tape, which was fed into this plotter. And then if we were 3D printing something today, we're still probably going to asynchronously design some object, take it to the printer, and away we go. So the turnaround time might be minutes or hours now instead of months, but the baked-in workflow is kind of the same. And so when I think about tightening up these, these kind of feedback loops even more, I think about music. And, you know, if you play a note and something sounds off, I, you know that pretty immediately, even if you're not an experienced music maker. Whereas if you set a print setting wrong, you might not know for hours, even if you're very good at 3D printing. And so this panel of buttons and, sl and sliders and knobs is a, is a MIDI controller, and it's just connected to my laptop over USB off screen, running a modified version of that same software. And the idea is we can just take the data coming in from any one of those knobs and modify uh, commands as, before they're sent to the machine. And so maybe one of these knobs is going to control the speed, and um, in code we'll map the incoming values to like, I don't know, to 10 to 100 millimeters per second to print that. And so once the instructions actually hit the printer control board, they're added to an internal buffer and we can't change them anymore. So to account for this, I'm just kind of automatically subdividing commands before we said, send them. Um, uh, so, like, instead of sending a 200 millimeter long command, maybe we send 200 one millimeter long move commands. And this way we're doing uh, less buffering on the machine side and we can uh, have access to things on, on the software side to modify them. And so, here's me kind of tweaking some knobs on the bottom and, and things happen on the machine in response. Uh, I've dropped the bed down a little bit here, so we're depositing this TPU from a height. And then I'm also changing the speed that we're printing at and the extrusion rate. And then if we cut to the point of view of a nozzle camera on the, on the machine, you know, I'm <laughs> it's literally the simplest geometry possible. I'm moving in a line. But if you choose the right settings, then you can get more interesting things to happen. So like right here, I'm going to up the extrusion rate. And you'll see the TPU starts kind of falling in these really, really repeatable coils. And so printing with these coils is called viscous thread printing, and you can do it to do some other fun stuff. Um, so, you know, by varying the internal structure of a 3D printed object, you can get regions with different mechanical properties. And uh, this is normally a totally geometric exercise. So you design some pattern and you repeat that internally in, inside the, your object. Um, but kind of another way to do it is to use these coils. And instead you can print bigger and smaller coils and print them more or less, more or less densely. And so there's a couple of TPU cubes shown here, um, and you can kind of get a sense for the different uh, sort of stiffer to more compliant response that we can get. And so then kind of like that cursed Benchy I showed earlier, it starts to get harder to kind of replicate and share this design because it's super sensitive to the settings that I've chosen via that MIDI controller. And um, this in turn is going to depend on what filament you're using, if that filament's dried out, all of these sorts of concerns. And so I think this is kind of fundamentally shifting the focus from the shape that we're printing to the settings that we're using to print that shape. So to that end, here's an example of using that MIDI controller to try and find out different coiling patterns we can get. Uh, the graph on the bottom is just rec a recording of the MIDI values that I've, uh, that I've changed, uh, which are extrusion multiplication, deposition height, and the speed we're moving at. And you can see kind of up in this top orange circle, we can get these like little sinusoidal patterns. If you change things a little bit, you can get these coils that alternate side to side. And you know, change things some more and you get these big old loops. And so kind of crucially, we want to be able to tie any set of parameters to what's actually happening on the machine at that time step. And so to, to, to think about this, I tried synchronizing that video of the machine to whatever, um, whatever G-code was being executed at that timestamp. So this kind of is like a transcription of the print job that you can refer back to and see what was happening. Um, so here, yeah, there's the video of that nozzle camera. To the left of it is the, scrolling down is the G-code that's being executed as the video plays. Just below that is a JavaScript code that's generated that, um, that G code. And then down at the bottom is a log of all the MIDI values that were tweaked. And so if you scroll back and forth in any one view, you can see what was happening in another. And so beyond these viscous thread prints, I think another place where, where this mode of using the machine is useful is in printing weirdly behaving materials. So this is a, a hydrogel, which is liquid when it's cool, uh, which you can see in the top left video where the material is kind of oozing out of the syringe there. But then as it warms up to room temperature, you can, you can print it like a gel. And so just doing simple things with this material can be finicky at first um, because, you know, there's no slicer, slicer profile to use for this. 
And this all becomes more exaggerated when you're kind of changing the recipe that you're using to print something or coming up with stranger concoctions of things to print. And so it, it, gets, it becomes useful to be able to quickly home in on relevant settings. And I think this, uh, this quote kind of captures the sentiment nicely where some scientists were talking about how it takes some skill to be able to print these gels. And um, they say that it requires know-how that's not openly shared or discussed in depth, but that's critical for success. And so zooming out then, the sort of goal of, of these uh, things that I've shown is to think about how people can both develop and share this know-how. And so I think this fundamentally th involves thinking about interactions across scales. So from individual machine capabilities to how people are using machines to how people are sharing designs with one another. And to adapt digital fabrication machines for use in these new contexts, I think we can think about hacking not only our machines, but our interactions with machines, uh, which this kind of alternative set of maker tools starts to get at a little bit. That's all I've got. If people have questions, I'm happy to try and answer. <laughs> Yeah, that's a cool point. I haven't been doing any of that, but I think rigging up more sensors always good. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it's all really just kind of, at the end of the day, it's all just a bunch of small linear move commands. So there's nothing kind of more complicated happening kind of I'm still just using G-code to do all that stuff. Um, but yeah, you can very quickly just like, say, move an assign function and make a little oscillating thing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm just always really surprised by clay because I just don't understand how it works. And so it doing anything is just a wonder to me. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about G-Code? <laughs> Negatively. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a lot of, uh, you know, negotiating entrenched standards with what people are using. Um, and I think it's like, with, with, for example, some of the scientists I've worked with, there's very little... It, they just need like a, a, a nice interface for using G-Code. G-Code actually does a lot of it pretty well. And so you can do a lot with a, a little there. But then, yeah, longer term, I would like to never see G-Code. <laughs> 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 yeah. Have you looked at the stuff that the control XYZ have I have, yeah. Yeah, I was working on this like the same time that was happening. They were, yeah, I, I, they, they also have, have some really fun stuff. I think it's really interesting. But yeah, full control for, for reference, it was, it's another kind of, I guess, pro they, they started out as like an Excel interface and now they have a Python library as well for like generating tool paths, yeah. Cool. Thanks everyone.